Welcome to Wayne's Old Time Radio Page Channel. I'm Wayne, your host. These programs are brought to you by support of our listeners. You can give your support at Patreon or PayPal, either one. There's clickable links in the description below. Thanks for your support. Enjoy the shows. The Golf Screen Guild Theater. Your neighborhood good golf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies welcome you to the Gulf Theater, the one place where you meet all your favorite stars. Tonight, we bring you Joan Bennett, Tyrone Power, Humphrey Bogart, and of course, Oscar Bradley and his Gulf Orchestra. And now, the director of the Gulf Theater and your host, Roger Pryor. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I've taken advantage of my job as director of the Gulf Theater to bring you one of my favorite plays, Robert Sherwood's The Petrified Forest. Four years ago, it played to packed houses on Broadway. And it was four years ago that Joan Bennett was making her first big hit in private worlds. Tyrone Power was an unknown youngster taking his first screen test in New York, and Humphrey Bogart was on Broadway. An outstanding success in the very play we're doing tonight. If you listen closely to tonight's play, you'll hear the same warning that audiences crowding into a New York theater heard four years ago. A warning of what has since happened to the world. When the author of that play, Robert Sherwood, the celebrated American dramatist, heard that we wanted to do the petrified forest here in the Gulf Theater, he gave us permission to present the play without cost. Because he knows that the Gulf Theater is really the star's own theater. He knows that every cent that Gulf would ordinarily give to the stars who appear here is given instead to help meet the needs of the Motion Picture Relief Fund and to build a home for the less fortunate members of the industry. And now, on with the play. Lights! Music! Curtain! Night has fallen on the highway that winds its lonely way across the empty wastelands of the Arizona desert. The wind sighs and moans through the sage and chaparral, driving the tumbleweed to flight like small gray ghosts. A coyote greets the rising moon and is answered on some far-off hill. In all this wilderness of wind and sand and night, there's but one friendly oasis, the distant, garish sign of a roadside restaurant, a garage. Just outside is Bose, a young mechanic. Gabby, the proprietor's daughter, is curled up in a chair by the window. When the falcon claps his wings, no wit for grief but noble heart held high. With loud glad noise he stirs himself and springs, and takes his meat and towards his lair draws nigh. Hi, Gabby. Oh, hello, Bo. How about a little kiss, honey? Oh, stop annoying me, will you? Can't you see I'm reading? Yeah, reading that pash poetry and listening to some sticky orchestra on the radio. That's all you ever do. What else is there to do in this godforsaken desert? Plenty say if you'd only pay a little attention to me, I could show you I'm things I'm really that... not interested. Why don't you stay outside and take care of the garage? That's what Dad hired you for. Oh, now listen, honey, I'm not as terrible as you think. I'm just a big guy with a good heart and plenty of red blood, and I'm full of love, baby. Ah, oh, gee, you're a beautiful kid. Ah, oh, Bo's, don't. Bose, look out. Someone's coming. Good evening. Uh, good evening. What can we do for you? Can I order something to eat? Yeah, yeah, sure. There's a menu. Miss Maple will take your order. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm going out in the garage now, honey. But I'll be back. And while you're at it, you might tell Graham to come in and get us supper. Okay, baby. Ready to order, sir? Oh, yes. I'll have, um, this hamburger special and some beer. You'd better bring me a double portion. I'm quite hungry. Driven far? Yes, quite a long way. But for the last ten miles, I've been walking. You mean you're just bumming along? Call it gypsying. You know, it's wonderful what progress you can make merely by power of the thumb. Where are you planning to go? That depends on where this road leads. It leads to the petrified forest. What's that? Oh, just a lot of dead old trees in the desert that have turned to stone. Sounds like a suitable place for me. Perhaps that's what I'm destined for. To be buried in the petrified forest. To become just another obsolete stump in the desert. <laughs> it's an interesting idea. I'm ready for my supper, Gabby. Okay, Gramp, I'll tell Paula to fix it. You ought to be ready in a minute, sir. Thank you. Uh, you like to see the evening paper while you're waiting for your food? Oh, thanks. You got the whole story about that Duke Man Tea massacre. <laughs> got his picture, too. 
Hmm. Six killed in Oklahoma City jailbreak as Duke Mantee escapes. Did he do all that? Yeah. <laughs> Folks in town say he's headed this way, but I, I don't believe it. He's probably got over the Mexican border long ago. He doesn't look like a gangster, does he? He ain't no gangster. He's a real old-time desperado. My gangsters is foreigners. Mantee's an American. He's a real killer, too. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, I know plenty of them in my day. Yes, sir. I come down into this desert 56 years ago, and believe me, my friend, things were different then. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. Double hamburger special. Your supper's ready, Graham. <laughs> I'm ready for it. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy your vittles, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. I hope you enjoy yours, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, that's a charming old gentleman. Your grandfather? Yes. Say, hey, you are hungry, aren't you? Well, you can go just so long without food, you Luck know. Luck been bad? Yes. What do you do? Do? Yes, for a living. Oh, nothing. That is, nothing just now. I have been at times a writer. Thinking of trying your luck in Hollywood? No. I'm afraid I'm neither good nor active enough a writer for that. But I suppose you hope to get into the movies? Me? Oh, no. I thought every beautiful girl had her heart set on Hollywood. Oh, that's just it. It's too common. I want to go to Bourg's. Where? Bourg's in France. That's where my mother lives. Oh, is she French? Oh, yes, that's where Dad met her. It was during the war. He brought her back here, and she stuck it out in this desert as long as she could. Four years. Then she packed up and went back to Bourg's. She writes to me. And on my last birthday, she sent me this book. It's the poems of Francis Villain. Ever read it? Yes. It's wonderful poetry. Mother wrote in it, A ma chère petite Gabrielle. That means to my dear little Gabrielle. She gave me that name. It's about the only French thing I've got. Gabrielle. It's a beautiful name. Wouldn't you know it get changed into Gabby by the ignorant dopes around here? So you share your mother's opinion of the desert? Uh-huh. But you can find solace in the poems of François Villon. Oh, yes. It takes the smell of hamburger out of my system. You know, that poetry's wonderful stuff. But that's the way the French people are. They can understand everything, like life and love and death. And they can enjoy it or laugh at it, depending on how they feel. It's plain to see you've never been to France. Take my word for it, Gabrielle. Stay here and avoid disappointment. What makes you think I'd be disappointed? I've been to France. I lived there for eight years. What were you doing, writing books? No, planning to write books. You see, I was living on my wife's money. Oh. Oh, please don't think too ill of me. I once actually wrote a book. Was it successful? Not very, no. It cost the publisher quite a lot of money, and it also cost him his wife. You see, she divorced him and married me. She had faith in me. She saw in me a major artist. Profound, but inarticulate. She believed that all I needed was background, and she gave it to me, with southern exposure and a fine view of the Mediterranean. For eight years, I reclined there on the Riviera, on my background, and I waited for the major artist in me to step forth and say something of enduring importance. He preferred to remain inarticulate. And you've left your wife now? I left at her suggestion. She had taken up with a Brazilian painter, also a major artist. There's nothing for me to do but travel. What were you looking for? Well, that's rather hard to say. I suppose I've been looking for something to believe in. I've been hoping to find something that's worth living for and dying for. What have you found? Nothing so interesting as a fair young lady who reads Villon and longs to go to Bourges. Are you kidding me? No, Gabrielle. I've never kidded anybody outside of myself. You shouldn't talk that way. I bet you could do wonderful things if you'd only try. No, don't delude yourself. My trouble is incurable. I belong to a vanishing race. I'm one of the intellectuals. That means you've got brains. I can see you have. Yes. Brains without purpose. Noise without sound. Shape without substance. Have you ever read The Hollow Men? It refers to the intellectuals who thought they'd conquered nature. And that... Do you realize what it is that is causing world chaos? No. Well, I'm probably the only living person who can tell you. It's nature hitting back. She's fighting us with strange instruments called neuroses. She's deliberately afflicting mankind with the jitters. Nature is proving that she can't be beaten, not by the likes of us. She's taking the world away from the intellectuals and giving it back to the apes. Huh? Oh, forgive me, Gabrielle, but I, I just can't tell you what a luxury it is to have someone to talk to. Incidentally, this beer is excellent. It's made in Phoenix. You know, you talk like an awful fool. I know it. No wonder your wife kicked you out. And no wonder she fell for you in the first place. That sounds alarmingly like a compliment. It is a compliment. What'd you say your name was? Alan Squire. I've been calling you Gabrielle, so you You know, Alan, 
There's something about you that's very appealing. Appealing? Yes, that's been my downfall. I was just thinking. I'd like to go to France with you. Oh, no, Gabrielle. No, I could never retrace my footsteps. You mean you haven't enough money? Even that is an understatement. Oh, don't worry about that. I've got plenty of money coming to me. Gramp has $22,000 sold away in Liberty Bonds, and it's all will to me. I guess we could travel pretty far on that, couldn't we? Too far. We could go to France, and you'd show me everything. All the cathedrals and the art, and explain everything. Of course, we'd have to wait maybe years. But, well, I could have Bose fired and give you the job tending the garage. That's a startling proposal, Gabrielle. I, I hadn't expected to receive anything like that in this desert. Wouldn't you like to be loved by me, Alan? Yes, Gabrielle. I should like to be loved by you. You think I'm attractive? There are better words than that for what you are. Then why don't we at least make a start at you? Haven't got anything else to do. No. No, that's just it. You couldn't live very long with a man who had nothing else to do but worship you. That's a dull kind of love, Gabrielle. It's the kind of love that makes people old too soon. But I... I thank you for the suggestion. And now I think I'd better go. Well, I... I can't stop you. No, Gabrielle, you can't. But you can do me one great favor before I go. Would you mind very much if I kissed you goodbye? No, I wouldn't mind. You'd understand that it would be nothing more... I'd than... understand. it would be just a kiss. That's all. That's absolutely all. Aha! Uh -huh. That's what's been going on in here, necking, huh? I've been watching you through the window. No, lay off him, yeah, Bose. Just because she's sweet and sweet, you thought you could get fresh, huh? Well, I got a good mind to take Bose. you... Bose, Bose, there's a car. Oh, well, lucky thing for you, mister. Come on, pay your check and get out. Well, that uh, brings us to another embarrassment. I haven't any money. No money? Well, of all the nerve. So you thought you could pay with a kiss, did you? You thought if you just... Bose, don't. All right, folks. Put up your hands and get over there against that counter. Come on, be quick about it. This guy here means business. He's Duke Manti, the world-famous killer, and he's hungry. Who's in there? Well, only one old man and... My grandfather's in there and Paul of the cook's in the kitchen. Bring him in, Jackie. Okay, Duke. Now, it's like this, folks. Me and the boys are going to park in here for a couple hours. The cops ain't likely to catch up with us tonight. So we can all be quiet and peaceable and have a few beers together and listen to the music. And not make any wrong moves. Because I may as well tell you folks that old Jackie there with a machine gun, he's feeling pretty nervous and jumpy. And he's got the itch between his fingers. So let's everybody stay where they are. It will be a moment before the curtain rises on Act Two of our play, The Petrified Forest. A moment in which we'd like to add our thoughts to those of the motorists in our audience who are giving a bit more attention to things like tire chains and heaters and windshield defrosters, and to, to the kind of gasoline they put in their tanks. Because winter helps all of us realize that the right gasoline has to combine a number of different advantages. Just one advantage isn't enough. And that's why good golf gasoline and golf no-knox gasoline in their respective fields have been designed to give you tops on every count. Take the important matter of anti-knock rating, for instance. No matter what car you own, no matter what road conditions you encounter, you will be more than delighted with the anti-knock performance of good golf and golf no-knocks. And you'll be just as pleased with the quick, snappy starts, the smooth power, and the high mileage. That's because the golf people improve their gasolines constantly, not just in one way, but in every way. They give you an even better gasoline today than they did six months ago, just as six months ago it was better than the year before. So for high anti-knock plus all-round quality, buy your gas the way millions of car owners do, at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc. Thank you, John Johnny. And now the curtain in the Gulf Theater is about to rise on the second act of tonight's play, The Petrified Forest, starring Joan Bennett, Tyrone Power, and Humphrey Bogart. It's two hours later. Duke Mantee and his prisoners are seated, but the air is charged and tense. The tables are littered with dishes and empty bottles. The radio's playing a dance tune. Bring me another bottle of beer, sister. Hey, Duke, we've been here two hours. When are we going to lay him out of here? When they get here. You mean when that blonde gets here? I think we're nuts to wait around Nobody here. Nobody asked you. Here's your beer. Oh, thanks, sister. Anybody else want a drink? I think I'm about ready for another one, Gabrielle, if I may. Listen, panhandler, who told you you could call her by her first name? Shut up, Bose. You think you own her just because she kissed you, huh? 
Well, let me tell you something, wise guy. She's pretty generous with her kisses. What do you think she was doing in my arms when you walked in, Bose. huh? Bose, that's a lie and you know it. Oh, you mustn't blame Bose for anything he says tonight, Gabrielle. He's under a terrific tension, just like the rest of us. Oh, the low, dirty rock. Oh, I didn't mean it, honey. I'm, I'm sorry. They, they got me absolutely crazy mad with those shotguns and machine guns staring me in the face. That's all it is, Gabrielle. You'd better have a drink, old man. I love you, Gabby. I love you, sweetheart. If I thought I'd done or said anything to hurt you, I'd go over and hang one on those dirty yellow rats. What was that, pal? Another crack like no, that? I'd be now. a little more tactful, Bose. Remember, these gentlemen here are your guests. Oh, honey, it doesn't make any difference to you what I'm trying to tell you. You don't know what it's like to be really crazy about somebody. I know better than you think. Well, how could you? Say, who were you ever crazy about? It's none of your business. But if you've got to know, it's, it's him. What? You mean that panhandler? Did you ever see him before? No, but that doesn't matter. I love him. I don't think I'll ever love anybody else. Can I possibly be drunk? Well, I wouldn't doubt it, the way you've been hitting that bottle. When he started to leave, I, I felt as if something were being taken out of me. I saw it as if I were coming out of a dream. I caught on to myself, and I knew I was just another desert rat, and I'll never be anything else. I'd better get rid of all that girlish bunk that was in me, like thinking so much about going to France and art and amounting to something. I'd better make the best of what I can find right here and settle down and marry Bose. Oh, no, Gabrielle. You don't give a hoot about me. You never could, Alan. I can see that plain enough. Why kid myself that I'll ever be anything else but what I am? You mustn't talk that way, Gabrielle. Why not? Because you're the future. You're the renewal of vitality and courage and, and aspiration. It's essential to me that you don't ever forget that. Your youth and hope. There must be some way... Sit I... down, pal. Jackie, turn off that radio. Okay. What do you care whether I sit or stand? I got to think about my health, pal. If I had a machine gun, I wouldn't know what to do with it. I want to talk to him. It's important. Me? You can talk sitting down. I heard you doing it. Very well. What's that, our horn? Yeah, I guess Ruby's getting a little fidgety. It's getting late. Go outside and tell him we don't land till I say so. And tell him right. not to hit that horn again unless somebody comes along. It looks like trouble. And to hit it plenty. Okay, Duke. Well, my friend, what's on your mind? Those Liberty Bonds of yours. What are you going to do with them? I'm going to leave them where they are. Yes. Leave them where they are. Your granddaughter is stifling and suffocating in this desert when a few of your thousands would give her the chance to claim her birthright. Uh, she'll get it when she needs it. When she has a family of her own to support. Probably a good-for-nothing, unemployed husband. Is that the future you want her to have? You were a pioneer once, but what are you now? A mean old miser hanging onto that money as though it meant something. Why in heaven's name don't you die and do the world some good? He must be drunk. Yeah, drunk. Or just about the lowest grade heel I ever run across. What do you mean, talking to an old man like that? Well, I ought to put the lug on you, you... All right, man, T. Put him up. Now I got you. I've been waiting all evening for a chance to catch you off guard. I've been watching this shotgun ever since you put it on the table. Bose, look out! Oh. Get oh. that shotgun, Jackie. Are you hurt, Bose? No, he, he got me in a hand. So you try to be brave, huh, wise guy? Yeah, and I'd have gotten away with it if you hadn't have walked in. Take him in there and bandage him up, sister. He'll be all right. Go with him, Jackie. Tie him up and leave him in there. Okay. Come on, tin horn hero. Oh, Lord, I had my chance and I muffed it. I could have... Now, listen. I let that mug make a mug out of me, but don't any of it try it again. Just keep in mind that I and the boys are candidates for hanging. The first time anybody makes a wrong move, I'm going to kill the whole lot of you. So keep your seat. Uh, say, Duke. Yeah? Would you mind passing me that knapsack? What do you want with it? I want to get out my life insurance policy. If you reach in there, you'll find a bundle of papers. And a fountain pen. <laughs> what do you want with your insurance? You expecting to die? You've guessed it, Mr. Maple. Is this what you want? Oh, yes, thanks. Now, Duke, I have a great favor to ask of you. Yeah? I don't think you'll refuse it because you're a man of imagination. You're not afraid to do rather outlandish things. What are you getting at, pal? This insurance policy, it's my only asset. It's for $5,000. Now, I'm writing on the policy that I want the money paid to that young lady in there. With Mr. Maple here to witness my signature, I'm sure it'll be all right. Now, what's all I've got to do with me? Just this, Duke. After I've signed, I wish... Well, I'd be much obliged if you'd just kill me. Why, Jiminy, he is drunk. Sure. And having a fine time showing off. Of course I'm showing off. I'm trying to outdo bows in gallantry. But can't you see that I mean it? I'm in love with her and I want to show her that I believe in her. How else can I do it? Living, I'm worth nothing to her. Dead, dead I can buy her the tallest cathedrals and golden vineyards and dancing in the streets. One well-directed bullet will accomplish all that and will gain a measure of reflected glory for him who fired it and him who stopped it. Will you do it, Duke? I'll be glad to. Just let me know when you want to be killed. 
Uh, pick your own moment, Duke. Say, just before you leave. I'd like to tell you just one thing, my friend. What is that, Mr. Maple? There ain't a woman alive or ever did live that's worth $5,000. And let me tell you one thing. You're a forgetful old fool. Any woman is worth anything that any man has to give. Anguish, ecstasy, faith, jealousy, love, hatred, life, or death. Don't you see? That's the excuse for our existence. It's what makes the whole thing possible and, and tolerable. And there's a man who agrees with me. Don't you, Duke? I couldn't say, pal. I wasn't listening. Then permit me to speak for you. He could have been over the border long ago and safe. But he prefers to stay here and risk his life. And you know why? Why? Because he has a rendezvous here with a girl. Isn't that true, Duke? Yes, pal, that's it. I guess we're all a lot of saps, but I wouldn't be surprised if you was the champion. Did you think I was kidding when I said I'd be glad to knock you off? I hope that neither of us was kidding. You know, you gave me the idea, Duke, when you called me a low-grade heel. <laughs> I take it back. You're all right, pal. You got good ideas. I'll try to fix it so that it won't hurt. You're all right, too, Duke. I'd like to meet you again someday. Maybe it'll be soon. Then you'd better come with me, Duke. I'm planning to be buried in the petrified forest. I've been evolving a theory about that that would interest you. It's the graveyard of the civilization that's been shot from under us. It's the world of outmoded ideas. There are all so many dead stumps in the desert. That's where I belong. And so do you, Duke. For you're the last great apostle of rugged individualism, aren't you? I wouldn't know, pal. Oh, how's Bose Gabriel? He'll be all right. You tie him up, Jackie? Yeah. Say, Duke, something must have happened to him. Maybe they picked Doris up. It's after 10 o'clock. We'll give him a few more minutes. A few more minutes. I must talk to you, Gabrielle. You can wait until after they're gone. No, I can't wait. I have to tell you now that I love you. I tell you that solemnly and with all the heart that's left in me. Hey, Duke, are we waiting just to listen to this? Shut up. You've got to believe it, Gabrielle. And you've got to remember it. Because, you see, you are my only chance of survival. You'll remember a line in Vion that fits that. Something about, thus in your field, my seed of harvestry will thrive. I've provided barren soil for that seed. But you'll give it fertility and growth and fruition. And after I'm gone... Alan! Hey, get back there. Leave him alone. Alan, if you're going away, I'm going with you, wherever hey, it is. Hey, Duke, it's a cop. Three cars full of them. Maybe Dora squealed. I knew that dame would get us into trouble. Now, will you lamb out of here while we still got a chance? Ruby, get back to that car and get that motor running. Take that Tommy gun, get over by that window, Jackie. Right. Switch out those lights, sister. Now, down on the floor, everybody. Come on fast. Close together in the middle. All right, Jackie, let them have it. Okay. Tommy them pans. Oh, it's an inspiring moment, isn't it, Gabrielle? The United States of America versus Duke Mantee. It almost restores in me the will to live and love and conquer. You getting any of them, Duke? No, but we're forcing them over toward the shadow of that mesa on the other side of the house. Their only cover. Once we get enough of them over there, we'll land. Alan. Alan, when you get to France, what do you see first? Customs officers. But what's the first real sight you see? The fields and forests of Normandy, and then... What, Alan? The fields and forests of Normandy, and then Paris. Keep it up, Jackie. We've got to move it over. Paris. That's the most marvelous place in the world for love, isn't it? All places are marvelous. Even here? Especially here, my darling. Alan. Alan, will you please kiss me? Okay, Jackie, we're pulling out. Good. Now, listen, folks, you've had a pleasant evening here, and I'd hate to spoil it with any killing at the finish. So you better stay right where you are for a while. Oh, wait a minute, Duke. You're not forgetting me. Alan, keep down. Duke, get out of that doorway, pal. Alan. Duke, you promised. Do you still want it? And it's no matter whether I want it or not, you've got to. Okay, pal. Ah! I'll be seeing you soon. Holy mackerel, he meant it. Alan. Alan. Graham. Go get Bose. He knows about first aid. It's all right, Gabrielle. It doesn't hurt. It'll be over in a minute. No, Alan, no. Bose, Graham, somebody, come here quick. I had to come all this way to find a reason. Oh, if people only had enough nerve, they'd always find. Alan. Always find. What, Alan? What did you say? Alan! Oh. oh no, don't worry, Alan. I'm not going to be a crybaby about it. I know you died happy. Didn't you, Alan? Didn't you? Gabby. Gabby. Are you, are you all right, honey? He's dead. Sure he is. Man, he couldn't have missed twice. We'll bury him out there in the petrified forest. 
That's what he wanted. Yes, my Godfrey, he said so. You know, Bo's the funny thing about him. He Rest in your field. My seed of harvestry will thrive. For the fruit is like me that I set store by. Yes, sir, he was the darndest fellow I ever did see. Couldn't make him out. God bids me tend it with good husbandry. This is the end for which we twain are met. Thank you, Joan, Ty, and Humphrey for a swell performance. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our stars are here before the curtain of the Gulf Theater ready to take part in the Gulf Question Box. If you remember, they must answer my questions correctly or pay a forfeit. You ready, everybody? Do we all play, Roger? Well, Joan, I ask as many questions as we have time for, and everybody plays except Oscar Bradley and John Conti. Oh, what do they do? Well, Oscar has to watch his music cues. Yes, and just what do you do, Johnny? Who, me? Oh, uh, mostly I just stand here watching and uh, thinking. Oh, thinking, eh? About what? Oh, uh, about lots of things. For instance, I was just thinking that it's about this time of the year so many of us begin to ask ourselves, how will the old car stand the winter? Up north, we're beginning to realize that a regular morning tussle between the starter and a cold motor is pretty tough on the battery. Further south, winter road conditions may make the running gear of our cars seem a bit stiff and squeaky. Well, if you want to laugh at winter troubles instead of worrying about them, stop tomorrow at your neighborhood good golf dealer. Your Gulf man will help you toward quicker starting with some easy-flowing Gulf Pride motor oil in the crankcase and some winter-grade Gulf Flex lubricant in the gearbox. And down south, as well as up north, Gulf Flex lubrication service will make your car ride easier and steer easier for a longer period of time. Yes, sir, it doesn't cost a penny more to have your car Gulf Flexed with Gulf's newly developed lubricants, and it does help you end winter motoring worries. Gulf even takes care of your radiator with a new permanent antifreeze that lasts all winter long. For complete protection for your car from front to back, stop at your neighborhood good golf dealer. Thank you, Johnny. And now for the question box. Our first question goes to Tyrone Power, now at work on the 20th Century Fox picture, Dance with the Devil. Ty, what star, famous for her portrayal of the young wife on the screen, was once known as the fastest girl acrobat in the country? Penny Singleton. You're absolutely... Bagwood's wife in the Blondie that's series. That's right. That's right, Ty. Absolutely right. And now, our next question... <laughs> our next question goes to Joan Bennett, who will soon be seen in the Walter Wanger picture, House Across the Bay. Joan, here's your question. If you were swimming at a certain beach along the rock-bound coast of Maine a few years ago, and you hollered for help, which of the following stars would probably have come to your rescue? Johnny Weissmuller, Betty Davis, Chester Morris, or Joan Blondell? Bobby Breen. <laughs> no, no, that's a pretty good guess, but I'm afraid it's not quite right. It was Betty Davis who spent a summer as a lifeguard at a beach in Maine. And Betty Davis will be with us next Sunday in a most unusual play written by Arch Obler. And now, Joan, for your forfeit. Uh -huh. I will name three motion pictures, and you have to give a sound effects preview of each. Now, don't look over there. They can't help you, honey, of every one of them. First of all, drums along the Mohawk. A sound effects preview. Uh Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> well, that's a good starter. <laughs> However, that's only one. Number two is Union Pacific. Union Pacific. Um. Woo-hoo! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very good so far. And the third and last one, and this is really a tough one. Gone with the wind. Uh. Careful now. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, thank you, Joan. That was swell. And thank you, Tyrone Power, Joan Bennett, and Humphrey Bogart again. Ladies and gentlemen, the announcement I'm about to make is a most important one for several reasons. Next week, here in the Gulf Theater, we bring you Betty Davis, brilliant twice winner of the Academy Award. Her play is the most unusual we've ever attempted. It's so extraordinary in story and scope and so startlingly new in radio technique that we believe you will long remember it as a truly unique experience. It will have a special Tchaikovsky score arranged by Oscar Bradley, so be sure to listen, won't you? Good. Until then, this is Roger Pryor saying, good night, everybody, for your neighborhood good golf theater. 
Humphrey Bogart is currently appearing in Warner Brothers' Invisible Stripes. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater originated at Earl Carroll's Columbia Square, Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.